Thank you. Hi, Thomas. How are you? Hello, Neil. Uh, I'm a bit yeah. weird, but <laughs> yeah, weird. Weird. yeah, a bit that way to do myself. Yeah. Living in weird times. We were just talking off camera for anyone listening beforehand that we both have this very strange sensation at the moment, even though we live a couple of hundred miles apart. We're on the same latitude, though, more or less, and. Yeah. Uh, we both feel like we're not awake. We have this strange sense of almost like we're observing a dream or not fully sentient or, you know, and sometimes you, you, you drink too much and you go to bed and you have a sleep, but you wake up and you're still a little bit inebriated and there's a sense of disconnection. And both of us have had a decent night's sleep and we're both having a strange, also my tinnitus is very bad today. And, uh, well, it was just off camera. We decided to include this in today's program uh, because um, uh, there's some weird air changes that have been going on. Now, I know, Neil, you haven't been paying attention that much to them, but I've been watching this stuff and there's some wacky stuff going on at the moment. And there's a more than a, <coughs> excuse me, there's more than a small amount to me is wondering if this is, the whole pandemic lockdown thing, is it a cover story for some kind of cosmic event that's happening? For instance, uh, the other day in Montreal, an enormous bang was heard in the sky. And uh, it was at nighttime. And people all rushed out to their windows to see lightning and rain. And the sky was clear. Nothing happened. And it was actually it reported all over the media there that it sounded it was like a, an earthquake in the sky was how they described it. There has been numerous close asteroid passbys in the last year, including a very close one the other day and some more ones to come. The space weather catalog of near Earth asteroids is off the scale at the moment. On top of this, we have volcanic activity all over the world that's really ramped up, including volcanoes that have been dormant for 800 years in Iceland have been spewing out uh, volcanic material to the point now there's a rapid melting taking place in the what they're calling an Arctic Spring. And dead Arctic walruses and other animals from the Arctic zones are washing up dead on beaches in Britain and Ireland. So uh, where I was just I I spoke about this on social media to other people, but it seems to me now that it, you know the, the famous scene in 2001 a Space Oddity, Odyssey where they found the obelisk on the moon they deliberately created a pandemic as a distraction to keep the public occupied now why would you have a pan a pandemic lockdown like this well the most obvious dangerous thing in all this would be something like an, ele an electromagnetic pulse happening out of the blue if an asteroid clipped the upper atmosphere it doesn't even have to hit the earth if it clipped the upper atmosphere it would send out an electromagnetic pulse that would destroy all electronics within its range, so basically on that side of the planet. So you would have a situation if an asteroid clipped the upper atmosphere, all the aircraft in the sky could potentially just fall out of it because all the electrical equipment operating there, hydraulics and fuel pumps would just stop and navigation systems, it would just fall. So you'd have thousands of aircraft falling out of the sky, you'd have ships that would suddenly stop at sea, which is kind of strange considering with this weird event in the Suez Canal at the moment with this trapped container ship. Yeah, that's strange. And it did this weird sign of like strange dance uh, before it lodged itself uh, sideways. Now that and that, that that that's looking like a real major problem now for Europe because that's all our imports from everywhere coming in through the canal. Yeah, yeah that so was. Things. That... You know, well, sorry, I was gonna say, modern ships are like self-driving cars practically. You, they basically have to switch on the computer and does the rest. Either that computer was hacked or something really seriously went wrong wrong with the the GPS part of it. But it's just one more thing of this very, very strangeness that's going on at the moment. And, uh, you know, every every day, every morning you wake up is a WTF moment. You know, it's like, what are we, and now stories of all these spaceships going to Mars and bringing human sperm and eggs with them. And uh -huh. opening, yes, yes. And now a new, a new lunar project to build a colony on the moon out of the blue and so on. It's like, I've been watching movies like... Uh, I know it's easy to get carried away, like uh, melancholia and when worlds collide. But you do, you do wonder. You know, it's just, you know, it's they're even admitting in the Irish Times today that most of the people who are to said died of the Rona here 
were all either very, very old or very, very sick. And there really was no one young and healthy who died. And it's just, what do you feel about that? You think that we could be dealing with a cover story? That's fascinating, isn't it? I didn't know that the Irish Times have actually said that. They've actually yeah. come out and, and admitted that. Yeah, I posted a headline today to my, uh, I'll send it to you when you, are you, is this on your channel, this video? Mm, I'll send well, it. Yeah, yeah. I'll send you the clip of the the, the, the online article, yeah. Well, it's not something I've, I've considered all this. I mean, I was, I was, I was hearing about that ship, supposedly one of the biggest container ships on the planet, 200,000, or is it 20,000 <laughs> containers on it? And it got hit by a bit of wind and it swirled it round. Yeah. I don't think so. No, no. So that oh. is really, really strange. So what, what we're saying then is if, if this is true, or the theory, then it would make sense to have all the legislation. You know, the, the, the legislation was passed again yesterday in the British Parliament. No, tell us. Well, all the all the um, the Corona legislation to basically lock everybody up was running out at the end of this month or, or yesterday. So what they've done is they, they voted on it again to carry on for another six months. And of course, it passed by 400 to seven, 403 to 74, uh, which means that that is back in place again. So may, if, if they were worried about something on a massive scale happening, it would be good to have people already kind of ready locked up, that they could just flip the switch and shut everything down. Yeah. But it, it's not something I've really considered, you know, it, but it's very interesting. Oh, I've been totally kind of near obsessed with it at this point. They, you know, it's like they, they, they tell the cheese heads that if they get their vaccination, they can go to Benidorm and then they ban holidays out of the blue. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know, know. It's, uh, uh, it's, not, it's, you know it's, it's just so strange. And uh, it's just that the, the main thing they're stopping people from doing more than anything else is traveling. Yeah. Uh, you know, traveling, the traveling long distance by car, train, bus, plane, especially, as if. You know, if there wasn't an EMP and you were in a foreign country and it happened, you might be stuck there for a few years and, and maybe a, a, a long, very, a very long time, more than a few years, while they rebuild the world's electronic systems on that side of the world. You know, all the data would be wiped out and everything. That's one side of the thing. The other side of the argument is even more out there. I mean, I, I've been definitely allowing my, uh, my tin foil to expand to have to grow in the last few days and i've just been considering all the possibilities another one is have they actually ruptured reality have they damaged reality oh, so, what are we like, oh, feeling the way we are the strange like i've been talking about the people are saying they're having dreams and the dreams are strange and it's like the dreams don't feel like regular dreams you know we've had cern we've had mm, quantum okay. computing quantum computing is a thing they don't fully understand they just throw calculations off into the ether and they come back solved to this kind of thing. And uh, the same with the, the CERN is, is now a new form of physics was discovered at the CERN. Now, when you have a new form of physics, you have a new form of reality, uh, mm -hmm. this kind of thing. And uh, and then the stories of Atlantis. I know in the future, you and I were talking about working on a movie together about the, our, our Atlantis uh, theories. And uh, the, the classic story of Atlantis and many other great ancient societies was that the like the like the, the dwarves in Moria and Lord of the Rings, they dug too deeply. They lost control of their technology, and it took and it caused a catastrophe in reality, uh, leading to cataclysms like what's happening now. Have they done something, and they're desperately trying to correct it? That CERN thing was always very concerning, wasn't it? It really was, and they talked about uh, creating black holes or if black holes there they say the black holes don't exist strangely enough but yeah. then, then like the whole of reality could be sucked through a black hole and another one formed and i mean they, they, they whatever they whatever there is to do they never get to the point where they say oh that's too dangerous no somebody will do it like when they set off the first atomic bomb with the manhattan project there was a danger that they could set the atmosphere on fire and burn yeah. the planet and they still did it still did uh, it they made a calculated risk and there was other things too like um 
Yeah, like the, the Higgs boson thing, there's a very interesting theory by Rupert Sheldrake that they didn't actually discover the Higgs boson, that the Higgs boson manif ma manifested itself for them. Uh, oh. it, it came to them. It, it reality, you know, like the, the forces, the unknown for forces of consciousness or whatever created this thing. These people have a very mechanistic view of science and reality. And yet what they're doing is the, the sort of the magical supernatural end of science and yet they don't even believe it exists that's what i find quite disturbing but what about all this that if you look through a lot of the dates are on um on solstices and equinoxes we were supposed to we're supposed to be i think the last the last decision was made on the equinox and it's all going to end on the 21st of june why the 21st one other you know it, it, the solstice at the summer solstice. It, it can't be a coincidence that this keeps happening. So somebody somewhere is doing yeah. this on purpose. And if they are doing it, well, they are doing it on purpose because you can't have that many coincidences. So it must be on purpose. Well, even the, the corona, you know, the, the sun, the corona around the sun. The, you know, it's like the strangest names they give for everything. And the, the, the sort of like endless... The endless, uh, it's almost like they're playing with us at times to see mm -hmm. if we're figuring this stuff out. It really does feel that way at times. And I'd be, when it comes to this conspiratorial stuff, I'd be one of the more conservative people. You know, I'd be the type to say, wow, well, well, you know, yes, it's true, but it's not as, it's not as sort of like out there as you think it is kind of thing. But at, at this point now, I'm really like, I'm ready for anything. It's like every single day is a, a WTF moment, you know, and it's like, What's to you know? Every time I switch on my the computer, and social media in the morning and look at the news stories, it's some and it's not from like fringe sites. It's from Newsweek and the Times in England or you know this New York Times, and it's 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 the strangest thing. I just don't understand. But this feeling that we both have this morning is very very odd. It's almost like it's almost like psychic high pressure as the way I would describe it. Yeah, and, that's and how I feel. It's yeah. combobulated somehow. I feel like I'm not right in myself. That kind of thing. Yeah, I felt like if somebody had slipped a sleeping tablet into my uh, into my drink because yeah. I like because oh god, you have to force yourself to to get going. Yeah. But you're half here and half kind of floating off somewhere really. But yeah, so if any, and that's why I haven't been making any videos lately. I've been like. Uh, something has told me from my subconscious from my daemon or whatever has told me to like don't make videos for a while yet just take a take a break from it it's not this is not the time to do it do something else and so i haven't been doing that for that purpose there's nothing wrong or anything but i'd be interested in people leaving comments in the bottom of these videos uh, and have you been feeling these things how do you feel about these air changes do you feel that we're dealing with something like this because you know the way I see it is 2020 was such a change that like it's all to play for now. You know, I, I, there's no such thing as, mm. you know, for, for a society obsessed with fake news, to me, there's no such thing as fake news anymore. It's all, it's, it's all so strange it could be real, you know? Yeah, everything is strange so it moves so quickly, hasn't it? I mean, yeah. I was thinking myself yesterday, just thinking of all this stuff. I mean, life life changes anyway, doesn't it? If I look back to what I was like when I was a kid, this is a different different world now. So it's it's kind of been reset in a way already. We didn't have yeah. mobile phones, you know. I I, I met an, an old girlfriend a couple of years ago uh, when we were both in actually we were both nursing at at the hospital. She was in the nurses' home, uh, and I was you know it's a combination. I had my own flat, and. She used to, she was, you know, and they were texting each other, you know, and she said, do you remember when I used to have to queue up in a line with a phone and put the, num put the money in and beep, 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 and the queue of people behind me, get off the phone, get off the phone. And all this stuff that were on computers that never existed. So the world yeah. has been reset, hasn't it, already? If you look yeah. between that, if you, if you jumped from those days to now, yeah. you would feel like you'd been moved onto another planet, wouldn't you? Yeah, the A and B button on the phone, you know. <laughs> yes, yeah, all that stuff, yeah. We never had any mobile phones or anything. It was really strange. And uh, so you would, wouldn't you? It's, so it's kind of, so in a way, what's happened is time has speeded up, in a way, even though it seems to have slowed down. Because, so everything's changed, except this time it's changed really quickly. 
Because I don't know about you, right? Now, I definitely, definitely think that time has changed over these last few weeks. Because you wake up on a Monday morning and, he, and by the time you, you go to bed, it's Friday. It's just yeah. like that. Boom, gone. Another week, another week, another week, another week, another week. But at the same time, even with that, have you noticed that between just before Christmas and now, it's 2020, the 2020 to 21 crossover seems very, very long. It seems yeah. like you know, it seems like years ago that we started this series of videos, and we only started in the back in the autumn or something. It's uh, sixteen weeks, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. That, that, so it's like twenty weeks max, and we take breaks and everything. It seems a hell of a lot longer than twenty weeks ago that we did this. So at the same that? time, as the weeks fly by, the experiences are compressed or somehow or they're expanded. Uh, years ago, one of the first ever videos I made on YouTube was about a theory I had that the, as your life progresses, the spirits this this the Fibonacci spiral you're following along you start on the outside you go around and around and it tightens and tightens and tightens and it's spinning mm. as you get towards the middle and that's becoming that's a spiral that's spinning in and then spinning out into a new cycle of consciousness I often wonder if we are now like I've been using this expression if consciousness not right now for the planet as a whole is on spin cycle Gee, well yeah it does seem to be it's a thought yeah like yeah. a product life cycle my yeah. God, yeah, that, I mean, we, we we spoke about spirals a lot, haven't we? It's, uh, if everything else is spiral, it just maybe time, it seems the same because we measure it in chunks, measure it in hours and days and minutes, but maybe those maybe those days, maybe the length of days changes without us knowing it. I mean, that's, that's not possible, is it? But it does make you wonder. The clock speed of the human brain is not fixed. That's one of the things that, like, the clock speed of the human brain is different than all of us. It's only mm -hmm. quantified through the creation of things like clocks and calendars. So your perception and my perception of time would be a bit different, but would be very different than, say, an indigenous culture that lived in, say, Western Africa or somewhere like that. Time for them would be very, very different, uh, especially in the cultures in Northern Europe where winters are, are, the days are much shorter than they are in summer, where, like, this part of Europe, we have extreme changes between springtime say summertime days and wintertime days in the closer you get to the equator the days are pretty regulated you know there's not much change so there would have been even the depth the difference in perception of time from people living in northern hemisphere in arctic and you know your sort of northern europe regions was completely different than people say living in in the indian subcontinent and further down in, in equatorial africa so it's only the creation of calendars and times and time pieces and clocks that regulates and fixes through onto cycles. Yeah, we um, we only experience time in this dimension, don't we? Get out of this dimension, there is no and there is no time. That's why I always thought all this thing about uh, past life um, things is all a bit strange because there, if we if you get if you move out of this dimension we're in, where time is measured, there is no time. So there aren't really past lives. Everything's happening at the same time. And right, for us now, to, even on a, on a day to day basis, you can time can shift by what you're doing, can't it? If you're sit, sitting there having a meal, a bottle of wine, I mean, you mean, four hours can pass in a restaurant, and you and it's uh, like that. Yeah, if you were if you were sat there like waiting, like in the doctor's for your doctor's appointment in the waiting room, an hour seems like ten hours. You know, it's like it's it's it's, it's how you it's how you associate with it, isn't it? How you how you experience it. The uh, and also dreams. When you have a dream, you could have like something that feels like it's taken days in the dream, and you wake up and you see you've only spent like five minutes sleeping. It's compressed yeah, yeah, the whole yeah. experience into a very short that, time. Yeah, that can happen, can't it? Yeah, you sort of, yeah, when I mean, you wake up and you think, oh my god, it's morning, and you look at your clock and you only went to bed an hour ago. <laughs> that happens to me all the time, I tell you. Reality is very, you know, reality is not fixed, it's not. And it's, uh, it's, it's very flexible and very malleable. And it's, it's getting more and more malleable and more and more flexible, uh, especially as this lockdown continues. This sense of eternal strangeness is, is oh, it, God, yeah. it's all pervasive and everywhere now. It really is, isn't it? It's like we're going through like a strange, strange existence. Anyway, should we go old tarot now? Yes, we're going to go into... Uh, it's your video today, so I'll let you start. We're going to go into the justice card. Justice card, yeah. I've got the uh, 
the rider weight one here, but I think I'll, I'll, put, I'll put it up on the uh, kind of there later on. So the justice card, uh, we're looking at the ideas of equilibrium, obviously because you've got the scales and everything, which is kind of karma, but karma is uh, action. And we also say work, but karma is kind of a different thing than people usually think it is to be, uh, and to the mystery tradition as well. Uh, so equal, equilibrium is kind of the basis of the work. Uh, it's kind of the, the, the wisdom tradition as well. It's a, a balance of uh, how you will move further to be a wiser person yourself once you understand it, which I think a lot of the, a lot of the keys are last. We, we talked about the Wheel of Fortune last week, and that was the law of rotation. So what we're doing now, we're going to sort of uh, apply uh, justice to this, this wheel. So we're going to act in a, in a, in a sort of maybe a correct way is the way of putting it, I suppose. So the symbolism, okay, we go through some of the symbolism here. Um, well, we said there was a Hebrew letter. Well, the Hebrew letter for the justice is uh, lamed or lamed, or it's, which means ox gold, which is actually a grasping hand. So it's like you like you you getting finally getting the grasp of um, of these laws that we're talking about. Uh, it's kind of the law of direct of directing yourself or directing yourself through this existence ray. Right? It's number eleven, as we said which is two ones, so that's obviously e equilibrium. It looks a bit like the sign for Gemini as well, which is the same sort of, the same sort of idea. And we've got, we've, all, we've talked a lot about the idea of polarities coming together. And on the justice card, again, you've got the two pillars at the back, which could be Yaakov and Bowles, that's Solomon's temple idea. And again, he's got a, a connecting curtain between the two. So he's bringing together the opposites again, which is something we I think we've covered quite a lot, really. Uh, as it, as it, you know, as opposed because we're talking equilibrium. So he's sat in the center again, like the high priestess did uh, earlier on, and one or two others. So he's in this pillar of equilibrium, and he's still got the two sides. So that's the that's the Kabbalistic tree again. We've got the two pillars on the outside, and you you tend towards the center. And the curtain as well has got lots of vibrate vibrations in it, like the, the high pre, like the high priestess's robe. And, the, and so the, the, they're not called vibrations, are they? But they look like vibrations, like creases. So they're um, that's uh, showing the vibratory existence, basically, of of, uh, of what we live in. He's got uh, a green cloak and a red robe. This is putting together Venus, which is green, and Mars. Venus is green, is nature, and Mars is the Mars force. It's like it's the active energy. So it's like we're, we're having, we've got active energy, but we've, we're, we're putting it all into the, into nature. So it's that kind of idea. I was talking about right action uh, before. Um, he's got a crown on, and on on the the right away, he has this crown with the three. Um, three points, well, they call it a triple ornament, but that represents the Hebrew letter Shin, and Shin is spirit. So he's got, he's got spirit of it, so he's, he's working from a spiritual, spiritual level. In one hand, he's got his sword. So a sword, the sword here is two things. Uh, it's dividing because it's, it cuts things down, but it's also got a T at the bottom, which is the handle, and that's Tav. And uh, Tav represents Saturn, which is formation and limitation. So it's the idea is cutting things down, uh, but forming to form something new with something that can be used for good or bad, as all these things are. Uh, the scales are obviously for, um, well, but it's too deeply for measuring things, as we've said before. Um, so the action that we think. So karma, okay, is working towards. Uh, an equilibrium in life, but centering on the central pillar, which is which is um, which is where our justice man is sitting there now. So, what can we say about uh, karma? Well, it's the the results of two opposing forces because you've got the two pillars. 
Okay, so these are the two opposing forces. And everything we know is of those two opposing forces. So the idea is that you try and get yourself back onto the center, as I said before, but you can't stay in the center because life isn't like that. And I really, I, I kind of really believe that myself, that you have to travel to one side, you have to travel back to the other side. I think that's where life gets interesting when you're on the wrong, when you're on one of the pillars of the, of the outside, but you've got to move yourself back to sort of uh, to carry on upwards. But I think if you stayed on that central pillar all the time, you'd end up in atrophy. I think you would just, you would kind of, life would stay, it would, it would stick in one point and you wouldn't be able to move forward. So you have to move to the sides to have a little bit of interesting existence. But if you stay on one side too long, you'll end up with like experiencing the negative sides because each side isn't just that each side is an opposite as well. It's like if you, you hear a lot of the you new know, ages that love and light, love and light, love and light. If you stay in love and light too long, my God, it'd be horrible, wouldn't it? I mean, all the evils of that love and light would come out and, and the light would blind you. Um, so I think that's, that's probably all there is about my karma thing, except it, except it isn't what people think. It isn't just punishment. Oh, you're going to get bad karma. You're going to get punished. And I don't think you necessarily have to take it on, take that on. Well, this teaching a little bit wrong, because you can change things. There's a there's a book called the Kabilian. It's part of the Mr. School I was in, and I've got a little thing here that I pulled out, and it says. To destroy an unwanted rate of vibration, put into operation the principle of polarity and concentrate upon the opposite pole to the one you would suppress. So basically, if something is happening at one particular side, emphasize the other side for a bit and it will drag it back into the middle. So there you're killing off what you would call karma. Yeah. Um, so it's not fate. It, it's not kismet, it's, it's action and works. So you can work on this thing. What you sow, you shall reap. Uh, but the tarot says that uh, as a result of thought, you can alter karma by changing it. Um, what you sow, you shall reap. But what you can select from, but you can select the seeds to determine the harvest. So there you go. That's my, uh, that's my interpretation of karma. Different than other people's, but... Um, that's the way I think it is. Oh, gee, yeah, that's, that's exactly what it is. Uh, the, that's exactly what, how I would see karma as well as the forces <clears> of <throat> natural justice. That's what the card tells us that you, human justice is not, you know, the final arbiter of everything. There's natural, there's natural law, there's karmic, karmic law. And that's why the scales is always portrayed as being never perfectly balanced. Just because it's just there's they're all it's always off one sec. Just because yeah, yeah, yeah. just because there's justice doesn't mean it's fair. It has to have that opposing force in order to what he said if you were to the, the stagnation would be caused by doing everything according to the letter of the law. You know, that's what the <coughs> stagnation is about. Whereas the uh, you know, if you have a bit of flexibility, a leeway through things like natural justice, you do not stagnate, like you said. Now, the justice card on some on pre-rider weight decks uh, is number is card number eight. And on post-rider weight decks, it's card number 11. This is a bit of a controversy that's been going on for a while. Some people say it should go back to eight because eight was the Greek letter of justice. There's a few things of why they changed the tarot in the mid 1800s. It was just around the time it was starting to become popular that it, this card was uh, that the tarot itself didn't come from the gypsies. That's something I still believe, by the way. That it is as it does have gypsy origins. That it actually came from Egypt. That became fashionable, and I think they started to change a bit the decks and some of the meanings and stuff. But I think that's how that came by. Man Levi was a big part of that. The whole thing of the Greek hermeticism coming from Egyptian. Egyptian thought. Now, uh, this is the Italian deck from about 200 years ago, and justice is shown as an angel. So we're talking about that represents the spiritual elements of justice, the, the higher power 
she has this, this, to notify her wings. Of course, the crown has the authority of the king, the sword showing that the decision is final, but at the same time, too, the scales are not perfectly balanced, showing that you cannot live exactly by the rule of the law. On her white gown, interestingly enough, around her neck collar is the Eye of Providence, the all-seeing eye, very, very heavily associated with um, Freemasonry. And this is why Fortuna is a, is a big character within the sort of the Freemasonic world. There's actually some of the lodges, are, many of the lodges in Germany are devoted to the goddess Fortuna among the Swedish white as well. But you can see that there. The Eye of Providence is that it's the the eye of God, or the eye of the esoteric Lucifer, uh, the blinding realization, the flash of brilliance and so on. But the just, justice must be dynamic. Justice cannot be stagnant. It has to change with the time. New laws for new ways of living. And that does not just mean man's secular laws, but also new spiritual laws. I mean, like nowadays, we're living in a different world anyway, you know, with the, the lockdown. So we have to develop new way, new modalities of thinking and what is right and what is wrong can't have that you have to have a flexibility of that so other people will say i disagree with that and hence why the scales are out of balance in the uh the pagan or heathen otherworld version she's wearing a crown of thorns to denote that she's a uh, again representing the lot the, the 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 chieftain or whoever the the ruling leadership is the scales is off balance she's looking down with her back turned to us showing that like justice is blind to your what you want, it operates outside. It operates outside that. The sword is, is raised in this one as if she's about to make a, a sudden decision with her back turned to you. It doesn't matter what you want. This is what's happening. And um, it's the concept of fates, virtues, and this kind of thing. The card represents equilibrium att attaining, but we do not live in an, a, a perfect universe. We are not perfect people. Life is not perfect. Therefore, the scales can never be balanced, ever. And natural law, natural forces, natural justice and karmic justice are the, are the final arbiter, even above that of the, the laws of man. And that's why the angels has just the wings here, representing the higher force, spiritual forces that are in charge of all this. And again, why her, uh, uh, the sword is raised up to the gods. And... Even the fact that the card has two different numbers in different decks even denotes this, this lack of perfect equilibrium. So it's almost like ironic in the sense that that would happen. The Justice card is... In, Crowley makes a big deal about it and the thought that it's, a, it's, it's, it's about legal contracts, but that's because he probably had so many legal problems himself during his life, particularly the court cases that, that you know, caused him an awful lot of trouble and so on, but also made him famous. And, um, but it's rarely, it's like the, the debt card is not is rarely about debt. The justice card is rarely about legal, legal earthly matters. It's much more of a spiritual path, a spiritual focus with the natural laws of the universe being the ultimate arbiter. And that's, I think that's about all I can say about the, the, yeah, the justice card. Yeah. yeah, I think the whole, I like the whole idea of, um, not sticking to that central pillar and you know and having justice the scales a little bit off yeah i think that's right because you've run a, a level playing field all the time you'd never get anywhere would you it's like in economics you, you, they always talk about trying to create a, a level playing field but level playing field always slips in one direction or slips in the other direction so it uh, and we don't want to be um atrophied at all. we want to be able to live well, that's why the gods in pagan societies, like the Nordic gods and the Greek gods, they had imperfections too. They made mistakes. They had foolishness and follies also. And that's what, you know, that's, that was the whole point too. It's like, you know, even the gods at some level aren't in charge. There are things even beyond their power. And it's usually the same things that cause us to make mistakes. Folly, uh, virtues, vices, and, you know, other things that are not properly thought out. You mean, the pettiness of the god of the gods as well that the gods are often portrayed as petty at sometimes and also uh weak they can often be portrayed as weak so that's i think you were a, a monotheistic abraham religion the god is perfect he's absolutely perfect and this is a this creates a schism where it's very difficult for a human being to relate to the abrahamic god as anything other than a dominant bully uh, because he's the final say 
when you think about that, um, with it being perfect and always the one God and that's it, it does can, it does produce atrophy, doesn't it? Yep. If you think about and, it. Well, you see, like the Quran, and I'm not knocking Muslims or anything, I'm just saying the Quran is considered the final book of Abraham. The final, that's it. There's no more books after it. You cannot alter it. There can't be a reformation. The Quran is written as the final word of God as it is, as it will never go anywhere else. So it, that's created a, cul a spiritual cul-de-sac for that religion that's caused all these schisms in the Middle East between different branches of the Abrahamic religion. There's, you know, you hear people say things like, well, you know, Christianity had can be ref was reformed in the during the enlight or during the Reformation. It'll probably happen in Islam as well. People don't understand that the Quran is unalterable. It is written literally written in stone. And so you have this situation where there will never be a liberalism within Islam because it cannot, it's, it'll be up to individuals, of course, against, again, the, it, the scales out of balance. Individual Muslims who say, I can't go along with this or I can't fully agree with that. But the, it is the ultimate, the end stop of all that stuff. And, just, and as you said, it causes, it causes uh, paralysis. It causes paralysis, social totally and does, yeah. What about this idea of uh, the gods um, playing with humanity on a on a, a game board? I like think a game a, chess. I, I've, well, as shown in the, in the Greek things, I think there's a lot of um, I think there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, I think that you know, fate is a, is a, a more of an, a proactive thing than we realize, and that could be a metaphor for us making our own fate. Uh, you know this kind of thing like the gods move in mysterious ways and they open and close doors before you oh god that's true a lot, but a lot of those times those doors have been opened and closed by something that you'd previously done or absolutely that that's the, the uh, total story of yeah so there so, you go the gods just like in hinduism the gods are very much uh, representative archetypes of the human condition well, i was thinking like for instance in the film jason and the argonauts with the um where they're actually literally up there in Olympus playing, playing, it's kind of a, playing a game of chess. We're going to move um, Jason to here and we'll move, you know, it's, it's quite a spooky way of looking at it, isn't it? I mean, you do wonder though, don't you, sometimes, are we being played like, like that in some ways? I think we are. I think we are, and uh, but it's also free will as well. You're giving, I mean, that there's been a lot of uh, requests for us to review this film, and uh, we both, we're both fans of it. It's a magnificent mm -hmm. film, uh, you know, considering the time it was made. Ironically, when that first came out, it was a bit of a flop. It only became popular in TV and video rental much later on. Yeah, I heard but, it didn't do well at the box office. No, people weren't ready for that kind of the, the, the message of, of seeing gods like Hera's jealousy is, is shown in it. Zeus is, uh, you know, there's bitterness. The gods are, can be nasty and bitter and cold and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And also, Jason is brought to Mount Olympus. He's actually brought to visit the gods. He's brought by Hermes. And um, that would be a very sacrilegious idea within an Abrahamic religion that a, per a mortal being brought to heaven while they're still alive. It would be, you know, this would be, you know, you know, 19 America had only just got out of like McCarthyism and you know, moral society and all this kind of thing. And you have the Bible Belt there and all that kind of thing. They probably weren't ready for a film that told that story in that mm -hmm. way at that time. It's hence, it hence why those films get more popular later. But the scene of the God playing, even at the end of the movie, Zeus even says, I haven't quite finished with Jason. While Hera is, is jealous that he's, he, she, she, she starts fancying, she starts fancying Jason and she, She's jealous that he's kissing the pretty mortal girl at the end. See, the gods have a lot of the same attributes that the humans do, which is a very, a very kind of upsetting idea to people who want to believe that God, God is perfect. You yeah, know, that, I mean, it's like it's like there are, there are the big people who've made the little people who make the smaller people and got in their image. I yeah. suppose it was 1963, wasn't it? So I was only one, but it's a bit like when the Holy Blood and the Holy Grail came out with the idea of Mary Magdalene being married to Jesus. Now. Who cares, you know? But then it was big, big thing. And then you had the the Monty Python um, 
meaning of not the meaning of life, the life yeah. of Brian. No, that matter. was a scandal. But if that came out now, nobody would flinch. Because yeah. things have moved on, haven't they? They've changed a lot. Life of Brian was banned in Ireland, and I can remember it was nearly banned in England too. I can remember videos of Malcolm Mudridge, Mud, what's his name, Mudridge, is that his name? He was like a Mugridge, BBC yeah. Malcolm Mugridge, yeah. Mugridge. Giving, giving it up large to John Cleese. And no matter how many times John Cleese said, the story is not about Jesus Christ. We make that quite clear at the beginning of the film when you see Brian at the Sermon of the Mount watching Jesus Christ. Yeah. It's about the absurdity of religion. And Ian Mugridge would not listen to him, would not pay him any attention. It was like re really arrogant. It's on they YouTube were, if you want to look at. They were interviewed with him and there was, um, what's his name? There was, uh, oh God, the other one, my favourite one really. But anyway, they were interviewed on one of these talk shows and there was one of the bishops there, the archbishops. And they said, well, when you watch the film, what did you think? And they said, well, we never watched it. <laughs> They'd never even watched it, but they were on television sitting there on a talk show, yeah. saying this is all wrong, everything you've done is uh, is heretical and all that. So they said, oh, you haven't even watched it, there's no point in having the conversation then, it's really. Which is typical, isn't it? I mean, really? that's, 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 that sums up, that sums up religion then, doesn't it? It's no, like, it, 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 and, and, and it made the point perfect, it made the point perfect that the film, The Life of Brian made, it's just that you, you, you ha can't have blind fate, and there they were yeah. with blind fate. Yeah. Uh, what I really loved about uh, Jason and the Argonauts, apart from the fact that it introduced people to paganism, uh, you know, Greco, help, you know, Hellenic paganism, was that it showed the the relationship between paganism and magic, and the, the scene uh, where Hercules steals the pin from Talos. Oh yeah, snake, yeah. And it cut. Uh, when I was a kid, and that scene where Talos turned his head like that, it was one of the most terrifying things I've ever yeah. seen. Yeah. Well, it like was real f terrifying as a kid, and uh, it's still is incredible. Ray Harryhausen, it's still an incredibly impressive piece of cinema making. Uh, yeah. But the, uh, the the way that they removed, they killed the the Taylor statue of bronze by Jason unscrewing the cap and le letting out the the fluid of life from the statue. You know, this this is that's just an amazing scene that and people didn't know about these things. They didn't know about Greek gods like Hera. They didn't, they didn't know about the, the Greek mythologies. And it doesn't the film itself doesn't stick steadfastly to the Greek to the ancient Greeks telling of the story. There's quite a lot of things done for cinema's sake in it. But um, the, the, the just it's just a magnificent film for its time. The scene where the Titan comes out of the out of the sea and pushes the two islands apart where the rocks and the narrows meet even in 2020 20, sorry 2021 that's still a very very well done piece of special effects by any standards how it's how it's done and even the, the the titan had this look about him that was almost like it, it didn't really care it was only doing fulfilling its fate and um the film, the, the, we all remember that amazing scene. Uh, that, that was one of those groundbreaking scenes where the Hydra's teeth were thrown into the ground and they came out as the skeleton warriors. Yeah. Just that, seeing that on the big screen wow. in the old days, that must have been mind-blowing. Mind-blowing. It's still mind-blowing. And that's so many things have come out of that, like the whole thing. Like definitely when Peter Jackson made Lord of the Rings, uh, he definitely modeled, stylized the army of the dead upon that scene. You could feel it, you know, in the battle scenes and so on. And um, the the beautiful colors of the Mediterranean, the beautiful scenery, yeah. everything was so elegant, the way they were dressed, the women were so beautiful and how they were dressed and everything. The, the harpies torturing the old guy who had offended the gods and so on. And um, it's just, there's just something about something very dreamy and evocative about even the way they filmed it like in those days because of camera and film technology was done in eastman color you couldn't do night time scenes very well so what they would do is they put a polarizing filter on the lens and really really darken it you see a lot of in that high plane stripper even had that that they darken it it's, it's obviously been filmed in the day filmed in the daytime but it has a, a high contrast look to it almost that gives that it's supposed to be nighttime but it's not really it gives it a very dreamlike quality. And that was used extensively in Jason and the Argonauts. And that really 
that's that that particular technique it definitely affects your consciousness you're definitely you, when you're watching scenes in films like that you definitely feel like you're in a dream or something it doesn't matter what it is and that was beautifully done in that film in that way and uh, it's 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 it definitely ranks as probably one of the greatest movies ever made and probably always will stand as that and not just because of the special effects but by the way it it, it affected people you know anyone who saw that as a child it, it, jason and the argonauts never left them it never left them the film and that's because it's magical it's pagan and it definitely taps into the archetypal mythological core of oh people. yeah definitely yeah definitely like you say mythological i mean it, it was the the hero's journey that's exactly what it was wasn't it going through uh going through different challenges um and those graphics like you say are incredible well, ray Ray Harry How they call him a Ray Harry Howson film, but he was just a graphics guy, wasn't it? It was what yeah. was his name? Don Chaff, James Chaff, who did John Don Chaff, who did the actual directing. Yeah, yeah. But it, it was it was absolutely a, it, it was it was like the first and the the best, wasn't it? Really, those graphics, like you said, fighting with the uh, the skeletons, and you, when you and it, it was that stop. Um, the stop graphics, wasn't it, where you would just film one bit, then another bit, then another bit. Apparently, just that skeleton thing took him eight months. But when you when he when you see them actually fighting, you know the clashing with the real life actors, it's almost impossible to do that, isn't it? It's fun. absolutely amazing. How we managed to time that up? Yeah, well, can you imagine him going to the director and saying, "We can do this scene where they're fighting the skeletons, and the the actors will be fighting nothing." But I'll yeah. make it work. Swords flash on the screen, or they can stab them, or cut their heads off. And it was like that—that—that's almost supernatural. We don't have that technology. Yeah. Like, co perfectly choreographing the actors, and also to I remember that the, the, remember the 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 the, 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 the animation scene, the claymation scene, the the stop footage scene. That would have been filmed at a, a very very high speed in order to create the the smoothest movements of it. And then that had then that had to be speed corrected in his mind with the choreography before they glued the two together on the green screen. And you're like, ow. And then there's multiple warriors. There's often three skeleton warriors yeah. fighting guys in the same city shot. All at the same time, yeah. Yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? But um, yeah, hero's journey. I tell you what, too. I thought Hercules was a bit of a jerk. Actually, he hadn't gone through his um, initiations really, had he? He was told yeah. not to not to steal anything, and then and he, he did it. So all that stuff with the with um, Talos, is it Talos, the the bronze yeah, statue, yeah. that was caused really by uh, by Hercules stealing that hairpin. If he hadn't have done that, and he, and he suffered no repercussions. No, he no, like, off. You know, if that was in the military, he'd face a court martial. He would have you know, got, got a massive trouble, wouldn't he? He got the because he's, he's lovely big, the lovely new boat they built, the Argos. It would yeah. be shaking it around. <laughs> he'd have to rebuild the boat, but they still and, wanted uh, to go and fight. And, and they lost men too. And uh, yeah. it, it's just the whole thing of that. Bra you know, you need brawn and brains for a hero's journey. So you need yeah. the strength of Hercules, but you need the wisdom of Jason. Uh, as well as the fate of you, you just you can't have both. You have to have. You, Didn't uh, Harley say? Uh, she said you will protect you, but only five times. And Hercules wasted one of those times, didn't they? Because they had to ask her whether they could carry on without Hercules or not. That's poor now. You know, it's got a lot to do here. We've only got four bits of advice from the from the Queen of the Gods. That was uh, on a black moon, wasn't it? Fantastic, really. Uh, what can we say just, about it? I there really, well, there really is much more to say about that film than just enjoy it. And it's yeah. also a great. Uh, it's a great doorway into Greek mythology. I mean, I'm, I'm sure it, it in that and Clash of the Titans from the early '80s with Harry Hamlin. I'm sure those two films both serve the same purpose that lots of kids and young people and even adults who watched them, who knew nothing about Greek mythology, were suddenly fascinated by it. And uh, yeah them towards it i watched it again last week again for after after many many years and i did think that the acting was so over the top at times it was outrageous really and the music boom 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 
But it, it's it's a thing of its time, isn't it? It's a beautiful thing of its time. A different world. The acting was sometimes very yeah, uh, like stage bad, not bad stage. It's like a William Shatner. The lines are over pronounced. You know, Hercules, what are you doing here? This kind of thing. Yeah, you know, yeah. like a lot of that kind of nonsense. You know, In a very sort of bravado way. Oh. And at and the, the end, that- when it, the way it finished, you're right. It just they've just been fighting the Hydra, and. Uh, Oh, no, no, it was after the hard, it wasn't, but they got the goal. Whatever happened, but it suddenly just stopped, didn't it? It was um, the king of the gods, Zeus, suddenly said, well, that's it now. We'll, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll do something else with um, with Jason in the future. Well, hmm. I think they thought it was going to be a box office smash and it was going to fund a spin-off series of movies. Yeah. But unfortunately, the goddess, the gods of fate didn't work out for the film. Yeah, and had to wait. 20 years before it became a, a huge success. Yeah, they probably thought it was going to do really well, so that was just like giving you the, the next bit so you could go on to it. It took well, so many years to make. Flash, Flash of the Titans with uh, Harry Hamlin and everybody, that was made like 1981. That was, and uh, Ray Harryhausen did the special effects for that too. That was probably really the part two, and it makes sense because it was around, it was just before that the film became legendary. And started to make money on TV and and uh, video rental. Well, what what happened to it was Todd Armstrong never to be seen. And do you know that his all his voice was was dubbed over. Yeah. All of uh, Todd Armstrong as Jason, he, you never saw him again. And, and, and so another actor came and, and dubbed over all all his all his speaking all the way through. That was very common back then. I saw some other film recently where I was quite shocked to find out that the main actor. Was uh, his voice had been all uh, dubbed over? Strange, and, isn't it? Uh, yeah, that was very common. All and also the disappearing thing, it was very common back then to have stars who had a, who did a very well for a bit and then vanished and never saw them again. You know there was you know there was one biblical movie I think like the greatest story ever told and the actor who played Jesus, he was also the original Captain Kirk I believe in the Star Trek pilot episode right. and he was looking at a phenomenal career ahead of him and then he vanished apparently he died young as well i mean it's just so funny it's like hollywood represents the, is this when you talk about movie magic and the, the fate of hollywood and the stars and all this stuff it, there's definitely a lot of that kind of thing in hollywood as well not so much in these days but in the past where it was kind of like the land of the gods in many ways and you had films companies like paramount and columbia mm. and you know the whole thing of the hero's journey of like someone like marilyn monroe who shows up and is nobody goes on to become the biggest movie star in the world and is then you know found dead alone all suspicious circumstances surrounding her death and the kennedys and everything else it really was you know it, it, it was almost like hollywood was a rep well america was founded as a kind of a, a neo classical republic in the in the greek and greco roman style and that, so that definitely carried through america right through the apollo missions naming all the spaceships and so it was at that mm. time period in america there was like even though we were just talking about the moral majorities and all the southern bible belt stuff there was always that strong neoclassical paganism element to american the american destiny and i think that shows in the hollywood films as well people who suddenly make movies are going to be a big star never heard of them ever, ever again yeah, I mean, he might have done better if he if he hadn't flopped at the box office. <laughs> but uh, but it, it's a bit like the music industry as well, isn't it? You get people getting into these uh, certain positions and I don't know if we should go into that, but, uh, you know, they, they kind of sell the soul at one point and then to, so they can be lifted up, they can be given fame and that fame that they've been given can be taken away like that. Click. I saw a picture of Amy Winehouse. Oh, God. Before our first album and how she ended up and you want to talk about a, a sad tale you know yeah beautiful girl just destroyed, beautiful. But absolutely just destroyed and really talented and everything just destroyed i heard her interviewed with jonathan ross and i was shocked actually because i just sat and went, god i'm not shocked not to think i was actually watching jonathan ross that's i wouldn't have got anywhere near the thing now uh, but he, he he was interviewing Amy, and she was a beautiful, beautiful girl, actually. And and she was so talented. I mean, that was real talent there. 
Yeah. And he said, have you ever been approached and they've asked, and anybody asked you to uh, join in it, to do anything you don't want to do? And she did that. They tried to turn me into a triangle. And I said, no. Wow. And uh, she was the last of the pop stars I had any interest in, in terms of like, you could say, okay, that's, that's someone, you know, she was the last pop star that I could actually point to a fin- my, my, my finger at and say, that's, that's someone who deserves to be a rock star, pop star. That's someone who deserves it. She comes from the same lineage as like Dusty Springfield and that that whole lineage of like really good stars and singers going back and uh, gone. Yeah, it's absolutely. I'm trying to think of the, uh, there was one particular song she did was absolutely beautiful. Um, I just can't remember it now. Like everything else these days, it seems to be shot at. But uh, oh yeah, she was amazing. Absolutely amazing. See, so the gods, the gods interfere in everything, it seems. Yeah, but are there these gods that we can actually see on the world moving things around, or are they some sort of spiritual being out of this dimension? Well, at the moment, it definitely feels like the, the false gods are in charge. It definitely does feel like that. And the gods have either abandoned us for a while or left us to, be t- to teach ourselves a lesson that we shouldn't have mortal gods controlling our destiny because... They do this crap to us that we're going through at the moment. Maybe that's the maybe that's the lesson, the justice lesson of everything we've spoke about in this video today between the gods, fate, justice card, and everything else. Is that maybe that what we're learning is that we've we've been abandoned by the gods because we put our fate in, into into the dark, the dark ones, the left hand path ones, the the yeah. techno. Ones. But will we learn our lesson? Will we learn our lesson? We think. Maybe not. <laughs> well, some will. Some we will. Still have, we, some still will. Have 11, we still have 11 more cards of the tarot to, to, to figure that one out. Yeah, when we get to the world. Yeah. Then that'll be our universe. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think um, we've come to our natural end of there. It's been really great. I mean, we've, we've, we've moved off uh, on stuff from side to side here, which is great. We've, we've gone off on various tangents. So no, it's been, it's been a fascinating talk. I really enjoyed it. So this me too, and this will be on uh, Neil's channel. And again, yep. subscribe to all the playlists, and it's put it's, it's put on the playlist on every channel. And uh, subscribe, comment, like it if you want, and especially comment about the, what we spoke about at the beginning. I'd be def, definitely interested to hear people' perception about things like that. Do you feel mm-hmm. like? that the, the whole Rona lockdown thing is a cover story for something. It, 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 it's just something way out there. If you think like a cosmic or planetary changes is the real thing. And because that's more and more what I'm, uh, I'm definitely, or a fracturing of reality. That's definitely what more and more I'm drifting towards. But anyway, there we go. So we'll say goodbye to everybody on that note, shall we? <laughs> and I'll say goodbye to you and I'll see you next week for yep. the next, the next, hero's journey if we can turn it into that see you neil bye